Sam's lab. Yeah, because you're in my ear. You're in my ear. You're in my ear, you're not, you've never been on the TV. Basement. Okay, good afternoon. Let's see, we've got seven to missing. I'm missing Benjamin. find the recorded uh, lectures uh, do you see other recorded lectures except the one that uh, you you the one that you needed or uh, you don't see any any one of them okay you found them all right good all right good good um let's see I, I, gentlemen uh, i i uh, try to set up this uh, evaluation thing so that we can all uh, do the evaluations this was the first time that i was going to use it i spent four hours uh, yesterday i just could not figure out how to set this up so far um uh, i'm still looking at it i i'm gonna go into some of the mm -hmm. tutorials to see if i can find a, how to use this option uh, on blackboard okay. but uh i I'm a little uh, baffled uh, with this thing. Uh, Matthew David uh, has a question about the exam. If you have a second, what the final form of the answer? The final form of the answer is uh, is a design. So if you can tell me that uh, this particular design will uh, meet all the uh failure uh, criteria the failure criteria in each layer as well as will satisfy no. the stiffness requirement that says uh, g uh, uh, shear modules uh, uh, basically looked at from a orientation angle around 360 should be larger than uh, five times the g12 of the of the materials uh so when when you look at those plots uh you should be seeing g sub v uh that will be the plot that you need to look at and uh, i think it will come as normalized plot with respect to g12 so the axis uh, in any direction in 360 direction should be a, a multiple of g12 and if i remember right uh those uh, that that uh, example uh, uh, tutorial uh, and build a number for normalization plus it up to six right. or maybe eight either six or eight uh times the g12 
uh, if you question whether it should also be isotropic, meaning the shear margin distribution around the 360 degree should be uh, just a circle, not necessarily. As long as the shape is inside the five times G12 line, you're okay. You satisfy that constraint. Now, uh, I keep also emphasizing the fact that I did not specify the, des the design problem to be a minimum weight design problem. So any design that you have that satisfies uh, all the constraints is a design. Uh, you have to decide where you're going to stop, whether you're going to actually find a design that is the lightest possible, uh, or whether you're going to... Uh, take any design that satisfies all the constraints, in which case you can go to a, a very thick ladder, I'm sure, uh, that will satisfy all the strength requirements. And uh, then you have to deal with stiffness requirement because the uh, change in thickness is not going to uh, influence the, the uh, stiffness requirement. Stiffness requirement will uh, be uh, uh, depending on the, the, the actual stepping sequence. Let's see, I heard a ping, uh, the effective G should be outside the 5 value, right? Uh, that is correct. That is correct. Greater than uh, 5 times you want to. Yeah, uh, it, it, that, that was, uh, I think, a bit of a mistake from my part when I was uh, uh, talking. I'm so happy that uh, you guys catch me when I say something uh, uh, like should be inside the the, the, the five uh, uh, normalized curve uh, five. No, it should be outside. All right. Um, so does that uh, clarify your uh, your question, uh, Matthew? Okay, very good. Uh, what were we doing the last time? I'm, I'm still struggling uh, wrapping up this uh, test one thing, and my lectures are getting uh, uh, distracted with this. We did the in place stiffness optimization. Uh, I have the uh, two lectures that, uh, that I need to go into next. One of them is uh, uh, linearization, and uh, the other one is uh, uh, fractional stiffness optimization. So let me summarize what we have done so far. If uh, we go to lectures here, uh, we did uh, uh, do the laminate properties, both uh, in uh, the stiffness computations in plane and bending. And then uh, uh, we found the stresses. Uh, from the stresses, we could evaluate, that was lecture six, laminate failure. Uh, then uh, we could uh, uh, compute in plane stiffness uh, properties. We uh, jumped into bending problem for the computation of uh, stresses uh, under a particular form of bending, which is the easiest to demonstrate, uh, other than the, it's almost like uh, saying uh, in-plane load distribution is the same e everywhere. The simplest way is a way that we can get this to bending instead of uh, saying uh, uh, Bending stiffness properties are going to be, uh, and bending related stresses uh, will be constant everywhere. That's very, very difficult to achieve. So we said, okay, we go to a cylindrical bending. Therefore, in one direction, we completely uh, eliminate the dependence of stresses into, say, y coordinate. So if you're bending uh, along the x axis uh, of, the, of the layout, these uh, bending systems are varying along the x direction. Uh, 
this is as opposed to in play problem where we were able to say let the uh, stress resultant distribution be uh, uniform everywhere, constant everywhere. In fact, we know that uh, in play uh, stress resultants do not remain uh, constant in a complicated part uh, like a plate with a, with a circular hole. So the simplest problem uh, we could do for in plane case to basically say that stress uh, resultants are constant everywhere. Therefore, we could compute uh, stress at any given point and the stress levels did not change as a function of location uh, in the, in the uh, laminate. Uh, the bending case, they are changing as a function of one coordinate x. Uh, if you want to make it uh, uh, constant, mx, my, mxy, then you have to bend the layup in some spherical shape uh, uniformly, which is going to be very difficult to, to either uh, uh, perform the experiment, let alone the actually think about it, how you can form a, a laminate into a uniform MX uh, distribution everywhere, everywhere in the, in the laminate. So what we did is, okay, we said MX is a, varies as a function of X, uh, nothing varies, varies as a function of Y. That was the reason why we did cylindrical bending. So we're trying to uh, set up problems that we can demonstrate some uh, design features uh, of laminates. Now, with that information, we went into in-plane stiffness uh, optimization problem. This is the first uh, optimization problem that we set up in a true sense that we uh, define an objective function. Uh, and uh, that objective function, in this case, was uh, stiffness uh, as opposed to strength, because strength is actually uh, makes the problem nonlinear. Uh, even though an x is constant everywhere, uh, the number of uh, layers changing the orientation angles or number of layers will change the, the A matrix. And uh, that design problem, that change uh, in the matrix uh, will change the uh, strains in the laminate. And those changes are going to have potentially cause uh, a nonlinearity somewhere in particular when you start using a, an interactive type uh, failure criteria like uh, Sci Hill, Sci Wu, or even the, some of the simpler uh, failure criteria like uh, uh, constant uh, uh, mass stress uh, failure criteria, the strength constraints becomes nonlinear in terms of uh, the plate thicknesses. Uh, but the, the place where uh, applied thicknesses are known to have a linear effect is on stiffnesses. The A matrix stiffness properties are linear in terms of uh, uh, thickness variables. So we actually uh, introduced uh, ply count as a variable and we used integer variables M and N uh, to actually do that and uh, in your homework problem, you did this uh, without doing the optimization by manually changing M and N, trying to find a, a satisfactory design. Whereas in lecture 10, in the implicit optimization case, we actually formulated this properly uh, that we could use the, uh, the integer variables M and N as ply count uh, variables to do integer linear programming to find the, the best M and N value uh, that minimizes the laminate, uh, say, weight. The next step uh, is to either go to uh, extend this to nonlinear problems by taking into account this, uh, this, this strength, uh, like the test problem. Uh, it's like a fork uh, we need to branch out uh, and or we'll do this too go to flexural stiffness the optimization and see if we can set up some of the design problems as linear uh, uh, problems in case of flexure design variables. And that's also possible. In general, uh, the most complicated problem 
is going to be the one that the problem is non-linear. Strength constraints, uh, bending constraints, and uh, bending stresses, everything uh, is non-linear. And uh, uh, the problem uh, can or may or may not be solvable by linear programming, in which case you're going to go and uh, use a, a nonlinear optimizer, an optimization algorithm uh, that's suitable for nonlinear optimization, which will be the g- use of uh, genetic algorithms that will allow us to actually use uh, integer variables in a nonlinear setting. Uh, but there's still some, uh, I guess, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, some benefit to gain by looking at the use of linear programming to see if we can actually extend the paradigm of using linear and integer linear programming to solve some of the nonlinear problems. And that's the topic of uh, today's lecture. Uh, lecture 11 is going to start uh, looking at the use, use of uh, integer linear programming for some nonlinear problems. So this is sort of the, the part of the lecture where I'm trying to set up the stage for what we're about to start. Uh, sort of summarized what we've done and what we're uh, uh, doing and what we will do in the, in the near future. If you have any questions about this, please do uh, ask. Um, I, I don't know how much I should be concerned about this, uh, that I, I, I f- I'd like you to actually participate uh, more. I see that uh, you guys are asking questions. That is very good. I appreciate those uh, quite a bit. But uh, if there is a reason for you to make this more interactive, to, to tell me that, hey, stop, uh, you're losing your... Uh, uh, I need to understand this better. Please do so. Do not do not uh, let me uh, keep talking. I can, I can keep talking uh, uh, forever. <laughs> In fact, uh, I'm noticing more and more that uh, uh, I'm running over uh, lecture time, so uh, I'm going to assign one of you to actually give me a, a, a five-minute warning uh, to so that I can actually uh, start wrapping up a lecture rather than uh, leaving the lecture without uh, giving much talk to how we're uh, uh, packaging everything. So should I uh, do that or is anybody going to volunteer if you could have extra classes that we cover just with the mega scripting that... Uh, well, okay, uh, that's... That's really uh, the reason why I have these uh, 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 office uh, hours, virtual office hours. I still in my calendar have uh, Monday uh, 1 to 2 and uh, Wednesday from uh, 1 to 2 as uh, 2 hours. And uh, I'm usually sitting in front of my computer with uh, my... Uh, uh, ultra open and uh, occasionally I get uh, uh, some of you ask questions uh, there were two people uh, uh, yesterday uh, who, who were there and asked questions and uh, we chatted a bit but if you really want me to go over something uh, I'll be more than uh, happy to, to do that and uh, extra lectures or uh, uh, no, if you want we can turn them directly into extra lectures so that I can talk more. How about that? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> of course, uh, you can you can interrupt uh, those, and you might as well interrupt me here right now to say okay uh, or no. Yes, yes. So. All right. Okay, apologies. Uh, we're going to take one. no need for apology. Uh, uh, but yeah, 
I I would actually enjoy it uh, if you guys uh, come in and uh, we do some additional things. Um, because this is something that, uh, that the material uh, is something that I care uh, a lot. Um, to tell you the truth, there are not many places uh, around the country uh, that uh, puts as much emphasis to this uh, design aspect, uh, what I would call computational aspect of the design, uh, as much as I do. Uh, I can paddle a lot of things uh, as a uh, lecture. I can talk uh, complete nonsense uh, and uh, do philosophies here about uh, the philosophy of uh, how not to uh, deal with your boss uh, during a design uh, practice and, and uh, how uh, you can steer them off the track uh, so that they what they want uh, uh, is not going to be uh, or what you do is not going to be what they want, so that you can do whatever you want. But uh, I, uh, I want to be uh, in the true computational sense. I want to give you information that uh, someday you're going to say, "Hey, I know a better way to do this than than you guys." And uh, I think this is it. Uh, I think this is. Uh, uh, one of the best ways to make a difference uh, in a design situation. Yes, of course, uh, design philosophies are important. They are very important. But you get to be exposed to those uh, quite a bit in uh, all kinds of other courses. Uh, I think uh, the purpose when we talk about uh, composite design, uh, my job is to actually steer you in the direction that, that those philosophies will have a, a meaning in terms of uh, composite design. So uh, I'm not going to uh, blah, blah any longer. Let me get uh, into my next lecture, which is uh, linearization of the nonlinear uh, composite pro uh, problem with uh, some strength uh, constraints. So this is sort of the, the charts. I think I'm going to put into a presentation uh, form so that I can use the pencil with this. Is there colors? Uh, red, okay, pen colors. Maybe it's like that blue. All right, so we uh, took the stiffness problem and uh, we said, okay, in place stiffness properties are a linear function of the thicknesses. And we can formulate uh, such problems, stiffnesses, uh, A11, A12, A22, even the uh, 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 EX, and not necessarily EX, but uh, GX and, uh, and the Poisson's ratio. And we can pose them as uh, linear functions in terms of the apply count uh, problems, uh, which in that case, implementation of uh, getting integer results, not continuous results for M and N, integer results, because that's what the design requires. Uh, if you solve the problem as a continuous problem and try to, to round the design to nearest integer applied thickness, it is doable. You have to be extra careful. It may be time consuming if the number of plies is, is, is large uh, or number of different orientation angles are large. Uh, so we introduce these ply count variables and we formulate the problem in integer linear programming and solve it. Okay. Uh, but you could not solve the problem that you just solved uh, in the test with that approach because the stress uh, constraints that, uh, that we say uh, each ply has to meet the psi uh, or psi vu or max stress criteria. Uh, you got nonlinear uh, constraints in there that uh, we couldn't handle with the, uh, linear programming, uh, let alone with integer linear programming. So, what is the thing that we can do? There is a 
a, a common trick in engineering optimization. And that trick is to use your engineering skill. Uh, engineering skill of turning something into a linear function while the original function is nonlinear. And I call this engineering skill, but in fact, uh, it uh, has to come with a bit of a mathematical skill. Then how do I express a nonlinear function as a linear function? And then what happens when I express a nonlinear function with a linear function? I can solve the problem, but do I get the answer that I want? Uh, the typical answer to that is no. So the first thing is uh, we're going to see how we can take a nonlinear uh, function and turn it into a linear function. And then uh, uh, we're going to use that function. I'm going to call f sub l or g sub l. Uh, f l will be the objective function uh, linearized. And if the objective function is nonlinear, you linearize it. If the constraint function uh, is nonlinear, you linearize it. So original formulation is f of design variables x, where f is uh, a not typically a nonlinear function, or g, j, number of uh, g constraints that you have. Uh, these are vector variables x. And x uh, is, let's say, a uh, continuous version of the flight count, say m and n. So my design vector x is basically equal to m and n. And m and n needs to be in, at the end uh, integer variables, but I'm just going to start with the continuous version of it. And uh, when I solve this problem, I'm going to find out an answer that is an engineering approximation to the original problem. Okay. And uh, it will not be the best possible design because I'm going to be going away from the points of linearization that I made so that the linearization that I originally made is not going to hold true. So if I evaluate the actual constraints uh, at the new design point, I'm going to find out that uh, my functions are not doing such a good job in linearizing uh, in, in, the, uh, in the actual domain. The linearized version is getting further away. Uh, so we uh, implemented an algorithm called sequential linear program, which means we linearize the problem, solve it, look at the answer, if you're not close to a reasonable good answer that we can judge, we're going to linearize again at the new point. We're going to design again, and we're going to look at the result. If you're not happy at the new design point, we're going to linearize again, and we're going to continue. That's the sequential part, sequential linear program. Uh, and then we're going to take this approach and... Uh, put it into uh, constraints uh, or objective function that are not uh, linear, but we're going to linearize them in terms of, say, uh, stresses, for example, and uh, demonstrate this, uh, this algorithm. So what is the standard uh, nonlinear form? Minimize f of x, objective function. Again, x is, uh, let's say, thickness variables uh, uh, Let's say x. Uh, let me. Uh, now nah, I'm, I'm gonna erase that. Uh, I didn't like what I uh, did there. Huh. There has to be okay. So control P gets me gets me back to pen. Okay, good. That's a good good to know. So uh, the variable variables are T. Let's say I'm not using I in there, so I can use T I, uh, where T I uh, is the 
is a vector of thicknesses T1, comma, T2, comma. I think uh, I used capital I for number of distinct ply orientations. So these are the thickness of uh, distinct ply orientations. So I can uh, be having a function which would be the weight. In this case, it would be uh, some of these things. So if uh, the thicknesses are used and I'm trying to minimize the weight, I can do uh, T1 plus T2 plus that, 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 which is summation uh, from uh, I equals one to capital I, number of distinct ply orientations, Ti. And then the constraints uh, will be G, uh, J of X. Again, these are going to be a function of thickness. As the thicknesses change, the stresses in the laminate is going to change. And typically that change is going to be nonlinear. So the constraint is written in the form G, J less than equal to zero, where uh, G and G is the number of uh, constraints. So if you have one uh, side hill constraint per layer, again, G will be uh, uh, equal to uh, sub G, uh, number of uh, NGs will be equal to the, the I, okay, capital I. If you have, uh, let's say, max uh, strain or max stress constraint, and if there's tension and compression involved, uh, then you will have five per ply. That uh, stress uh, along the fiber direction should not exceed tension, should not exceed compression. Uh, transfers to the fiber should not exceed tension, should not exceed compression. And shear uh, stress should not exceed uh, some shear allowable. So per ply, there will be five uh, constraints. So that will become, uh, in case of max stress, uh, at least five times uh, capital I. In case of uh, uh, Psi Hill or uh, Psi Wu, it will be just I. Now the trick is the, how do we uh, linearize if any of these is nonlinear, either F or G or both uh, are nonlinear. Uh, the approach for that is the mathematical thing called uh, Taylor series expansion. If you take any function, Okay, you can use the Taylor series expression of that function to make an approximation to that function. The Taylor series expansion is always made about a point. Okay, so in the case of M and N, non integer uh, thickness variables, uh, let's say uh, uh, M being the thickness of the, the, the 60s and uh, N being the thickness of uh, uh, zeros. Uh, then and treat them continuously, then the x uh, super zero uh, could be, I don't know, uh, 3.5 and 2.75. These are not integers. and But this is, let's say, the first one is the thickness of plus minus 60s, total thickness, and the second one is total thickness of the, of the zero degree plus. The, the function that I'm using is nothing, uh, anything like that. I'm using a, a, a strange nonlinear function here. Uh, let's assume that my objective function was e to the x, exponential uh, x, okay? And I had only one variable, uh, x, lowercase x, not boldface x. Uh, this was boldface uh, x. And if I plot, make a plot of this function, uh, you, you get this blue line. Uh, at x equal to 0, it has a value of uh, 1. And any value other than the, uh, 0, it has uh, this nonlinear functional form. If I take a number of terms, uh, in the Taylor series expansion, uh, which includes the constant term, B 
which is basically, this is linearation approximation of this function, helices approximation of this function uh, at x equals zero, or in this case, x equals zero, not matrix form, but uh, single variable. And this is, by the way, coordinate x uh, along this, uh, this direction. Uh, this is a constant term. And if I actually use the, the constant term as an approximation of this blue line, I would have been getting a horizontal line here. Then I add one more term, which is the first derivative of the function with respect to x, evaluated at uh, that point, evaluation point. So my evaluation point, my construction of my uh, Taylor series expression is about this point, this specific, this point, nothing else. Uh, so this is the first term, uh, other than the constant term, in the series expression of uh, the Taylor series expression of f about zero. And that would have actually given me a line, a tangent to this. So only this much is actually a very good <laughs> approximation right here. It may be actually re also reasonable in this, say, in this range, but it uh, fails horribly. Uh, if you go to an x value equals 1, the difference between the, the approximation, which is here, and the actual function, which is here, is very large. So I can improve this by taking another term in the Taylor series expansion, which is the second derivative of f evaluated again at x0. And this brings the curvature of this uh, function f about with respect to x, it's the second derivative, x squared. So now this becomes uh, a, a, a curved line which will come and touch the original curve here. Oops, jumped again. And then uh, maybe go like this. I don't know. It's quadratic, so it's not straight. So let's say at x equals 1, the error between the approximation, which would be here, and the original uh, is much reduced. But maybe it's still not acceptable for me. If I go to third derivative and include the this term, this term, then I get this uh, yellow curve. And this is actually a very good approximation. The problem is it's not linear. <laughs> this is a nonlinear term in terms of x, and this is a nonlinear term in terms of x. So why do we do not like this? Because if it makes the problem nonlinear, that's number one. Number two, even though I'm making an approximation to, to f, computing these uh, second order and third order derivatives are expensive. They're not easy. You need to use all kinds of techniques to compute those because you will never have an analytic expression. Potentially, that you can take the derivative and do a very good approximation. But besides that, it automatically makes the, the problem nonlinear. So sequential linear programming says, you're an engineer. Take the linear part. Assume that uh, your function is this, uh, let me switch to maybe a red color. Take the, the linear approach, which is tangent to the <laughs> and line. <laughs> That's a straight line, gentlemen. And it touches the curve or the curve here. And use that, knowing that you can only deviate small amounts Oops. around the original point. So you do your design, 
and following the uh, red line, and maybe you will X will change and come closer to one, and you're gonna stop it. You're not gonna let it go all the way to one to have a big error. Maybe, maybe you're gonna stop it earlier. Maybe you're gonna let it go up to one. But as soon as you get there, you're gonna stop and say, okay, how bad is this? Compute objective function uh, linearly, compare with the original function. Bad. Then you make a second linearization about this point, and which will take you to another linear approximation to the nonlinear line going like this, touching being tangent right there. So that's the approach. Uh, so the standard form is there, and this is the linear form. Uh, we will have a uh, shoot. Don't jump. We'll have the, uh, the constant term, which is the objective function evaluated at the base design point, initial design point. X0 is the initial design point. And maybe you will take m equals uh, 5 and m equals uh, 5 as the integer. Uh, evaluate uh, your weight and your uh, constraints. And then uh, add a term that says, by the way, uh, if you know the change of f as a function of your variables, m and n, uh, you will have a linear approximation by taking uh, this uh, uh, m minus m0 partial f partial m, evaluate that x equals x0. And then the second term will be uh, if there are uh, uh, two uh, uh, variables where i is uh, from 1 to a capital N, a small n, or we can make that to be actually i if you like, capital i, uh, in case of uh, m and n being two distinct orientations, i will go to up to 2. So you'll have two terms added for uh, multivariable function. Uh, and the constraints will be the same way that uh, the stress evaluated at the base point time uh, plus uh, uh, the two terms, two additional terms instead of n, let's use capital I, uh, I from one to two, and this will be M minus M super zero, where uh, super zero is my initial point times partial uh, G, that could be my stress constraint, partial M, evaluated that X equals, or M and N equals M and N super zero. This could be a function of both M and N plus N minus N super zero times partial G and partial M evaluated at uh, X zero, X equals X zero, which is M zero and N zero and super zero. Same term as here. Okay. So if we turn this, uh, we're going to show how to do this, because the trick now is, how do I compute this? How do I compute my stress constraint and the ply as a function of all the ply variables, all the ply, variable, uh, ply count variables? How do, we, how do I compute those? That's not the, all that straightforward. But in the case of uh, composite design problems, it turns out to be a, 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 a actually a, not too bad, not too bad. So, but uh, how would the algorithm work? Uh, again, graphically, if this was any other problem uh, in two variables, x1 and x2, uh, two design variables, and my function is linear in terms of x1 and x2, these are the contours of the objective function, and I'm trying to minimize uh, these. So if I go x1 infinity uh, towards that direction, I'm going to be minimizing my function, but the constraints say uh, that you cannot go beyond the 
uh, this line. This is a constraint uh, that uh, restrains G1 to be less than equal to zero. That's this one. And G2 says that you have to be on the left of this line. So this is the G2 constraint. Less than equal to zero. Uh, then the feasible domain is only in this side. It's a nonlinear problem. Boundaries are nonlinear. So I need to go in that direction. And uh, if I do a linearization of it, of that problem about x0, my g1 and g2 becomes this. This is g1 linear. And this is G2 linear. So I'm going to replace these constraints, the red ones, with these purple ones. I'm going to design, and the optimizer is going to tell me, OK, increase the uh, x as much as possible. And the place that it's going to get me is here. The original uh, solution is here. I'm further away. But hey, it's OK. If I go here now, and establish new linearization with the G1 and G2. By the way, note that uh, since the point that I'm linearizing is not on any of these curves, these uh, linear uh, approximations do not become tangent. They are tangent at the distance to, to this G1, and this thing is tangent perhaps into this line, but they are not on the curve because the, the linearization point X0 was not on one of these curves. So I'm going to re-linearize about x1. And that becomes these two lines, purple lines. So I started with this design, designed it, I found this design, designed it, I found this design, but I'm still not here. So I'm going to linearize this is, uh, again, uh, g1 linear about evaluate that uh, uh, x equal x1. And this is uh, the second constraint, g2 linear, about this point. And I find x3, then I uh, do linearization again. I didn't continue, but uh, you, see, you will see that actually these curves will become closer and closer and eventually They'll be, uh, become tangent here and tangent here, which uh, takes you to, to the actual solution in an iterative fashion. So we're going to do the same thing for a composite design problem. The trick is to be able to compute derivatives of these constraints with respect to ply thickness. So let's take a uh, a problem uh, where, again, we have high number number of distinct uh, orientation angles, say zeros or 45s or 90s or 15s or 30s or whatever you might take in the uh, alphabet of uh, distinct light orientations. I have a question, I suspect. Okay, it says, uh, when uh, would you know uh, you're close enough to the exact answer? Do you wait for convergence of the linear solutions? Uh, it can be done either way. That is, uh, what you say is, is a way that if you see that linearization, uh, one after another, is giving you the same uh, numbers, then uh, your linearization is not changing. So your new design points are very close to one another. So that would be one way of stopping. Second one of the uh, way of stopping is uh, actually uh, uh, more accurate. You compare the value of actual function, evaluated the new design point, with the approximation, linear approximation. If a constraint is active, then you should be getting uh, the same answers, okay? So those constraints that will become actively controlling the design, they will converge. The approximate value of the function and the, uh, 
the real value of the, the function will become the same. What would that mean? Let's say we are implementing a apply a, a stress uh, constraint side hill, and in the fifth ply, the stress uh, you have to evaluate the actual stresses at at the end of every optimization cycle. You compute the new stress, and you compare it with what uh, your approximation is giving. If they are the same, then you you converged. Does that uh, answer the question? Mm, right. Okay. So this is a, a problem that's uh, similar to the to the one that, uh, that you did. I put it into presentation form. Go P. Mm. And uh, in this case, I'm going to actually uh, try to minimize the weight. Okay. I did the uh, option P, if I like it, P. Yeah, there it is. So this is the uh, weight of my uh, laminate. Uh, there is rho here, but uh, this is density. I'm going to assume uh, all the density of each ply to be 1. This is potentially a way also to to control existence of a ply or not, but uh, let's not worry about that. So ignore this term that uh, P sub K, uh, density of a given layer is, is always 1. So the total uh, uh, weight of the laminate is uh, not the weight anymore because I got rid of the density, uh, just the total thickness, and that will be 2 times T1, uh, or T, let's say, 0, plus 2 times, uh, or 4 times T uh, S for 60. Ah, uh, we, we were using zero for this. Not zero. Yeah, C. So this is a limit, let's say, uh, zero uh, TZ slash plus minus 60 sub TS. Or we used uh, NZ or M, uh, N, what did we use? N, uh, 60 N, S, N, S, N, Z, or N, S. No, we, we used M, N, S, right? I forgot uh, what, what we were using. Uh, M and N, just M and N. In the uh, in the composite part, we used N sub uh, zero for Z, N sub uh, S for uh, sixty instead of M and N. So we had something like this M and N. These were interchangeable, and these two were interchangeable as well. Get through. Uh, hold on a second, uh, gentlemen. I think there's a, a minor emergency here.
Oh, good gentlemen. <sighs> the disaster is not uh, prevented. There's a pipe that was leaking uh, under the house. And I believe the leak is uh, <laughs> turning more serious. Water line. <sighs> Are you all there? You still hear me? Good. Let me catch my breath and figure out what I was doing. Okay. Any questions so far? Because now I'm gonna get into a critical part. Good so far. All right. So the part uh, that becomes uh, becomes interesting is uh, uh, this part. Our constraint, uh, it was a stress constraint. Okay? Stress in each ply uh, should be satisfied. And if you look at our constraints, they are either on the uh, stresses or strains. But the, the difference between stresses and strains is basically, uh, uh, it's like sigma equals E epsilon. Uh, in, in our case, uh, uh, stress is equal, uh, N's are equal to A times epsilon. So let's uh, assume that for a minute that uh, we may be using max strain criteria instead of max stress. Same thing. Let's assume that uh, our uh, uh, constraints are written in terms of uh, strains, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, uh, gamma 1, 2, for each ply. K is now going from uh, 1 to capital I. Okay? And in each ply, uh, we have this uh, generic uh, function that has a coefficient pj, qj, rj for the k ply. And uh, uh, j is... Uh, uh, the, the constraint on the ply K. Now, the reason why this is PJ, uh, uh, QJ, RJ is, uh, uh, let's assume that we're using max stress or max, max strain criteria. In this case, we're just going to be basically comparing epsilon one, uh, of the K ply to the epsilon one allowable and make sure that that uh, is less than one. Then we're gonna comp uh, compare epsilon to, uh, two with, uh, with this. So there will be, uh, J will be uh, equal to five in this case. Because in each ply, you will have five constraints, one for each strain component, X uh, compression extension, uh, y compression, y tension, and shear strains. If you are using uh, uh, psi hill or psi wu, it's a quadratic function. These p's and q's and r's will be different, uh, but uh, j will be only one. Uh, the formula for stress uh, failure uh, or strain failure will uh, actually have uh, all terms in one formula. So these P's and Q's and R's could be different for different failure criteria. And the, the number J could be different depending on whether uh, the constraint on is interactive in one formula per ply, or there will be multiple ones like uh, five of them. Uh, two in the longitudinal the direction of the fiber, two in the transfer direction, and one in shear. And then uh, we also have uh, potentially constraints on the A's, but they are already linear. We already know that the constraints uh, with respect to strains are linear. And then the design variables uh, are the ply thickness variables, and they are uh, not negative. They are all uh, positive. You cannot have a negative thickness. So uh, this J 
applies to this. Depends on the, the type of failure crater, yeah? And uh, K is the number of distinct ply orientations. All right. So now I have uh, this form. Let's take one particular <coughs> failure crater, yeah? Instead of uh, J equals one, I'll make it more com complex. If, if J is equal one and you use psi hill or psi blue, you have to put the appropriate equation in here, replacing these PQs and R's. But in the case of, uh, say, mass strain, uh, I have uh, uh, a constraint on tensile normal stress or strain, uh, compressive normal uh, strain, and uh, shear uh, strain. I keep saying stress here, these are actual strains. This meant strain. And P1 uh, would be 1 over epsilon tension allowable. Uh, Q and R0, uh, that's, these are transfers to the fiber. Uh, P2 is equal to 0. Q2 is epsilon 2 uh, transfers to the fiber. And then uh, allowable transfers to the fiber. And R equals 0. The compressive strains if the strains are compressive, then uh, uh, P3 is minus 1. Uh, these are 0. Uh, P4 is equal to minus 1 over uh, epsilon uh, uh, 2 allowable in compression. Uh, and then if the shear strain constraint is there, then uh, you basically have uh, this. This one. Or you can say absolute value of... Uh, shear strain. Uh, so instead of writing six of them, we typically say uh, uh, five uh, instead of six. And we, we say uh, absolute value of uh, gamma. Uh, what did we use? One, two. must be less than uh, gamma one to allowable. That's how we uh, come up with uh, uh, gamma divided by gamma one to s uh, must be less than equal to zero. So if you put R6 uh, in this equation here, Gamma over gamma, uh, uh, gamma one two over gamma one two allowable must be less than equal to zero, or minus one must be less than equal to zero. That's the constraint. So this is the max uh, failure strain failure envelope. Now the approximation. Uh, if you write the approximation to the nonlinear uh, stress. We are going to be evaluating at given uh, original design thicknesses. And then we are going to add this, uh, and this would be, let's say, in our case, equal to 2, uh, add uh, these. But note that uh, now the strains are still, uh, we, we haven't uh, accomplished much. Uh, because we really need to evaluate these things, uh, these derivatives, and turn them into constants. We haven't evaluated them yet. Uh, these are going to be evaluated at uh, each of these derivative terms, each of these uh, partial, partial ti terms must be evaluated, their form, and uh, they need to be evaluated at, uh, say, uh, capital T0, ball trace T0 at the original design. Okay? How do we evaluate these derivatives? 
of the strains with respect to thicknesses. Um, we know that uh, the, these are stress strains uh, along the fiber and transfer to the fiber direction. We have a relation uh, through transformation that uh, the strain uh, along the fiber direction, epsilon 1, for the Kate layer uh, is tied to the strain principle transformation matrix times strain epsilon super zero. So this is from uh, how to find the max principal stress uh, strain direction strains from the midplane strains in the xy coordinate. Okay, and that's through m's and n's. These are constants because orientation angle, and they are uh, cosine of uh, theta and sine of uh, theta here. So these derivatives that I need here are here and they are related to the derivatives of the midplane strains uh, through the transformation relation in matrix form uh, partial derivative of uh, strain midplane uh, the principal strain with respect to ti is equal to uh, t matrix transformation matrix for that particular uh, Kate layer, and this is the tra strain transformation uh, matrix, and this is the derivative of the midplane uh, strains, the xy coordinate with respect to ti's. So these terms are now can be written in terms of these, but I I still do not know what these are. Okay, derivatives of the midplane strains with respect to my design variables. What are those? Well, it turns out that uh, we are back to good old uh, equation that defines those midplane strains in terms of the stress resultants, okay? Uh, which is, uh, in case of lack of bending, there's no plus B times kappa in here. Those terms, uh, this is completely in play. So B times uh, kappa. Uh, term doesn't exist uh, is this. So what I do, what we do in the engineering design is typically if you have a governing equation like this, we take the derivative of that. And derivative of that expression with respect to the same variables is ti. So derivative of n with respect to ti is equal to derivative of a with respect to ti multiplied by epsilon 0 plus a times derivative of epsilon with respect to ti. So there are two terms that will change as a function of my uh, thickness variable. The a matrix is going to change and the epsilons are going to change. And their change are related to this expression, but I know for a fact that uh, and is that actually is constant in this particular formulation. The stress resultants only change uh, if there were additional complications in the problem, like uh, uh, hole, in which case n will be a function of spatial coordinate of the laminate, but still it is not a function of the thickness. And it's constant at any given point with respect to this thickness. If the uh, integral of the, the stresses uh, through the thickness, and that is not going to change uh, with respect to thickness. So this thing is equal to zero when you take the, the derivative of it, because this thing is zero. OK? And I heard a beep. Four minutes, uh, oh, geez, I am late. 
Uh, okay, but this is my last chart. <laughs> I think. Let me see. This is this my last chart? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is what I wanted from you guys to, to tell me where to when to stop. So let me wrap this up. Uh, the change of n with respect to e is equal to zero. Therefore, this thing is equal to, uh, oops, is equal to zero. And if I take this term out of this expression, derivative of the mid-plane strains with respect to the thicknesses is a matrix inverse times partial a partial thickness times epsilon. Okay, and uh, uh, this is no fixed constant uh, uh, a matrix. Then I don't know what partial a partial thickness is. Is it? No, actually I know what it is. Uh, a by definition is sum of the uh, through the thickness layers. Qi times zk minus zk minus 1, which is nothing but actually tk. So partial of A with respect to tk, t, uh, thicknesses, is nothing but simply Q matrix of that particular layer. So if I need the uh, derivative of plane strain with respect to thickness uh, of a particular ply orientation angle, I take the overall A matrix, multiply by the Q matrix of that particular layer, and the strain, I'm done. I found the derivative. There is no need for finite differences or any other uh, methodology to compute those derivatives. And this is what the trick is. Now I have a, a solid expression that doesn't require any derivatives to find the stress constraints in a linearized form. And we're going to use this in the tutorial uh, next time to actually show that uh, that we can do this. With that, I close the, the lecture part. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. And end this lecture in one minute, which will be on time. <laughs> Thank you. This was the real end of the lecture. And this is an important formula. That makes life a lot easier for us. Thank you, Murray. I'm going to wait another minute. And if not, oh, I didn't say record the lecture today. There's. Uh, missing persons, we completely forgot them. Oh my goodness. Ah, another uh, uh, note to you guys. If you see that uh, we are missing somebody, uh, remind me to record the lecture. Or remind me to record the lecture so that uh, I mean, we can keep it. I, mean, I don't mind you, you, you looking at this uh, later on if you're missing something. So. Maybe I should make a habit of uh, starting recording every time. All right. In that case, you have a wonderful afternoon. And I'm going to go back to my emergency. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>